I chat with Dr. Steve Mobley Jr. and Khalil Miller from Xavier University of Louisiana. How y'all doing? <clears throat> how you doing, Dr. Mobley? I'm doing good, Khalil. How are you? you? I'm good. How was your Easter? It was good. Okay, good, good. It was good. It was pretty quiet. How about you? It was, but I'm not even mad at it because, you know, it was a good way to end our spring break. I just cooked a little food and uh, hung out with some friends. Fellow sip a little okay. bit. But it's good. Though. Okay, okay. So you're, are you, you, don't, you don't live on campus right now? No, I don't. Um, I'm off campus. Okay. But no, Easter was quiet. Easter was really quiet. Um, okay, I guess I should introduce myself. So, how y'all doing? My name is Khalil Miller. Um, I go to Xavier University, Louisiana, XU. Um, I'm a part of the wrestling team, our band. Um, I know Miss Hill. She was um, getting everybody in the chat to kind of go, uh, you know, roll call for the school. And I'll put Xavier in there for our best band. You know, we really got a good sound. Um, I'm majoring in psychology, and I'm currently trying to get into a, a public health program at Xavier as well, because I do. Uh, I love my school, like, as much as, you know, we, as much as the HBCU experience kind of puts you through the ringer, you know, as a lot of y'all probably know, um, it's very enriching, like, the environment, um, the people you'll meet, the experiences you'll have. So I, I just love my school. So that's why I just want to continue being here and uh, continue being a part. Um, I'm the oldest. Uh, so I think that kind of stems from my kind of wanting and desire to be, uh, take on mentorship roles with like younger kids. So that's kind of what I see myself doing in the future. And that's kind of all about me. That's my little spirit. <clears throat> it's so good to be with you today, Khalil. Um, I am C.D. Mobley Jr., and I'm an associate professor of higher education and student affairs at Morgan State University. Um, I'm doing a little bit of repping for Howard tonight because that is where I graduated from um, in undergrad. I loved my time at Howard. Um, I thank Howard for everything because it led me on the track to even getting a PhD. Um, Everything that I research and I explore uh, within my research is focused on HBCU communities, specifically that of um, how queer and trans students navigate HBCU spaces, how do we deal with class and classism within HBCU spaces, how do we deal within race and racism, all types of um, different types of research. So I am excited to be here and talking about being um, unapologetically Black and free within the workplace. So I'm glad to be here. Definitely, definitely. So how how would you say that, you know, being that you are established in your field, how would you say, you know, showing up like unapologetically free and work, do you think it's easier now that you are, um, you know, kind of esteemed, you know, you have your, uh, your, undergraduate degrees, your graduate degrees. So do you feel like it's easier now to, you know, kind of be yourself in, you know, any work environment as opposed to, you know, someone like me who's who would just really now be entering the workforce, you know, in a few years. So how would you say, um, would you say it's easier or maybe a bit harder at this stage of your career? Um, I would definitely say that it is a little bit easier um now but i remember when i was 22 and uh, just finishing at howard and you know going through my master's degree um and trying to figure out you know what's what and then getting my first job um like how do you show up authentically um am i going to decorate my office a certain way um am i going to you know what am i going to be like with my coworkers? Um, but I made a deal with myself very early on in my career that if I could not be Steve, then that was not going to be the place for me, if that makes sense. And I was willing to take that risk and, and leave if, if need be. And I was going to show up in all of my, you know, what I say was full blackness. So every part of my identity, 
Um, I've done that in every job and it hasn't always been easy. I've had to leave different jobs because I knew that they weren't here for all of me. Um, but, you know, I didn't leave a job without, you know, having one, but I had an exit strategy, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, no, but I don't know. I don't think it's any, every job is different. Like I just started, you know, right at Morgan State University. Um, but I feel like when they interviewed me, they knew exactly what they were getting um, because I was very authentic in my interview. You know, um, I wasn't going to hide, you know, my beliefs and things like that. But I've always been that way. Um, right. I wasn't willing to trade and take on that kind of, um, I don't know, I can't even say the word or think of the words, but I wasn't going to, because it's not even like it's code switching, but I wasn't going to compromise myself right. Right. in that way in the workplace, you know? I think that's a good point. Um, when you mentioned just being, you know, yourself and even an interview, I think that, um, employers really pick up on that type of stuff and they appreciate it because like you said, often I think we do um, have a tendency to cold switch, you know, to kind of maybe get the advantage in these type of professional environments. But I remember I, um, a manager I had once told me before, they were like, um, before you step into any room, you should know who you are. So like off of that basis, you, you won't be able to get anybody to kind of, you know, persuade your views or try to get you to act, you know, in any other way that's not true to who you are because you know who you are. Like at the end of the day, before I even apply for this job, before they even call me in for the interview, before I ever have my first day, like I already know who I am, so I'm set. And so that's kind of something that's really stuck with me because I feel like I've definitely had a tendency. Um, I'm not proud of it to like, like you said, kind of diminish my identity or like, you know, who I, who I truly am just because I don't want to be portrayed in like a certain type of light or like maybe perpetuate any type of stereotypes that, you know, are centered uh, around black males in our society. So yeah. that's something I'm definitely uh, working on more, I would say. And Kula, I will say this, with age and the more that I have grown in my career, because I think about myself being and before I was an academic, I had a little over 10 years working in, you know, higher education, different institutions like Georgetown and Maryland, and, um, different um, nonprofits in, you know, D.C. But I think that the older I get, my filter lessens. <laughs> and it is almost like I got asked a question recently um, from a student, um, you know, because I had a, I had to read one of my articles and, you know, myself and my co-authors, we ended out the article with like a Master P quote. And my student was like, you know, aren't you afraid that they, you know, meaning white people are not going to understand. And I right. said, my research and my work is unapologetically for black people and black communities and the black gays. I'm not here for the white gays at all. You know, if you watch the documentary with Toni Morrison, she said once she knocked that white man, you know, off her shoulder, she says, I no longer had to write towards him. And I'm not writing for white people. I'm not writing for the majority. And that's how I feel. Um, I'm, my work and my being and my space is not for whiteness and white supremacy. In fact, it is for black liberation. And I am unapologetic in that. And if you don't like it, then, you know, you're not going to understand my research or my work or my classes or anything. But that is, that is, yeah, that's central. That's central right. me. Most definitely. I think uh, I think it's really important you say that um that you know your work is designed for black people. Because I think uh sometimes we might try to insert ourselves in these spaces that aren't designed for us, you know, just because um we might really want to be there or kind of like just prove we prove we fit in and like you know we belong. And I don't think there's there's anything wrong with that, but at the end of the day, you you do want to center yourself where your target audience is and also who will appreciate, you know, you being in that space at the end of the day. Because a lot of times we are in environments that, you know, aren't tailored to to who we are as black people, maybe are not tailored to um, you know, our ideas, our beliefs and our attitudes towards certain subjects and that 
environments and people that don't really see us as you know full full american beings because at the end of the day we are yeah. black and at times you know that's just the that's kind of just the gist of it. we're black so you know certain things certain spaces are just not not, not designed for us Mm-mm. at all I think so that for me. <laughs> I do want to ask you, I wanted to ask you, I'm sorry, I'm pulling up a question I had because I can't remember at the top of my head. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, so how do you, as far as entering the workforce, how would you say not even answering, but more so because you are in being in the workforce now, how would you say that you maintain your professional boundaries um, if you feel the need to do so? Um, because I'm not, you know, aware of the relationship you have with your coworkers, but um, yeah, how would you say you, you maintain your professional boundaries? Sure. Um, I think that when I was just entering into the workforce, um, some lines were blurred and that led to professional messiness, right? Um, there was a part of me that when that happened, like in my first job, I kind of vowed that I would never have like work friends again <laughs> because it became too complicated. Um, but I've since amended that. But I mean, it did lead to some drama. I think we were all young very young in the workplace and you know if folks fall out with people um that could bleed over into the work environment and it can lead to drama um and i said for a while um maybe i wasn't mature enough for those relationships but now i think that with remaining or trying to set professional boundaries um i do think that there needs to be some type of symbiosis um with your colleagues so that you're able to you know forge forward and you know reach a common goal um but you know i'm just wondering you know as i do move forward um i kind of loosen that a bit but i do think in the beginning it's important to learn people um and kind of be an observer and you know what's happening right. and not you know jump in you know head first always because yeah you know, what happens with that, you know? Right, right. Yeah, I think I, um, from personal experience, I've definitely had, um, you know, some situations where maybe, you know, our group of coworkers, um, not necessarily anything bad happens, but, you know, sometimes you can become maybe a little too familiar with each other and it could get to a point where sometimes you're not even doing work. You're just kind of just there and I think it could be in the way of um, maybe growing within that job. But at the same time, I do think that um, it's good to be in environments like that where you are very comfortable. You know, it, it almost feels like y'all are friends, you know. But at the same time, I do think that, you know, there needs to be some, like, common ground or, like, separation. So that, like you said, the lines don't get blurred because, you know, things can get messy at the end of the day. Yeah. But I will say this, though. Um, I think about my time at Georgetown. I always call it this beautiful interlude. Um, so I was there for three years before I finished my PhD. And in that process, my mother was like literally dying. She was very, very sick. And there were times when I had to leave work or take a phone call from a hospital. Um, and my coworkers really had my back. Right. So I would be having like advising appointments all these students at my door but i was literally handling you know my mom's and my family's business and i had co-workers that would step in right these were the same co-workers that were um at my graduation or my dissertation defense um they were the first ones to show up like for my mom's funeral so we did grow very very close and they stood in the gap for me and i'll never forget those co-workers but i think that i had to mature in a way where I was able to have and I have that much more of an adult kind of relationship. Um, I always joke 
with my um my other friends, I was like, you know, or even with them, I'll say, you know, I don't usually keep in contact <laughs> when I leave a job, but I still keep in contact with those Georgetown colleagues because they literally held me down when life was life, you know? Right. Um, and had they not been there, it would have been very, very different, uh, a very different experience, if that makes sense, you know? Okay, for sure, for sure. And I'm glad to hear that you did have, um, it seems like it was a, a solid support system, you know, given that it was, you know, work, because sometimes, you know, we just don't have that. So I, I am happy to hear that. No, most definitely. So Dr. Mobley, um, kind of piggybacking off that, how do you think we can bring up issues affecting us within the workplace um, in a way that, you know, will ensure our concerns are validated and not only that, but appropriately addressed. Sure. Um, so you have to know your audience and know and find allies within okay. your, 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 whether it's your office or your company, people that you know are going to back you up when you wanna really go for broke on an issue, right? Um, I'll give you an example. I was in a staff meeting um, one time and I had a colleague make a, a very um, horrible comment. Basically she was like, cause we, I, I brought the fact that, you know, the books are very expensive for our students and we have students that are legit struggling, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, she said, um, well, if they can't afford books, perhaps they shouldn't be a student at Georgetown University. And there was a moment when I remember kind of stepping outside of my body and looking down <laughs> on the actual Honestly. conversation and then coming back to myself. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and I confronted her head on. And I said, did you just say that, you know, poor or low income or perhaps first generation students shouldn't be? at Georgetown if they can't afford books or even major in business because they can't afford the books to be here. Oh, no, I didn't say that. No, since that's exactly what you said. Right? right I'm trying and, to say that. Uh, Listen, and my boss and my other colleagues chimed in and was like, you know, but in my head, I'm, I was like, why did it take me having to speak up? Right? I was the only man in the office. I was the only black man in the office. Why did it take me saying something when everybody else knew that it was wrong? Does that make sense? No, that that and makes it was a lot. That moment where I was like, I can't do that. Like, I, I mean, I've had many of those moments where I've had to speak up um, mm -hmm. on behalf of students and be an advocate, even for other colleagues and coworkers, right? Because you can't let somebody make you feel uncomfortable. But I know that I had allies that were going to back me up. But you know, sometimes as black folks, you know, you got to pick and choose what you're going to do because you're being in a perpetual state of rage. But mm -hmm. at the same time. You know, I think when we're at certain tables, we have to speak up, if that makes sense. And yeah, I've yeah. always been that way of not being able to sit with what's wrong, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. No, that's that was a, a, a excellent point because Miss uh, Miss Hill, uh, she spoke on Doctor. I'm sorry, she spoke on um, one of her slides said uh, using your voice, and I think that's something that's you know huge, uh, uh, not only for Black people, just for anybody if. You know, there's obviously something that you don't stand for. It's important for you to say something because, you know, that lady, she could have, you know, obviously that's how she thinks. But, you know, she could. I'm it, I'm glad that you, you know, you kind of checked her, her frame of mind, because that's that's not how someone in the field of education and caring for people entering the institution should be acting or should be thinking. So At I all. think that, yeah, I think, and I, I applaud you Dr. Mobley for doing that as well, because not a lot of people no, I'm, I'm are- I check people. <laughs> for sure, for sure. I, I am, I am. And, and it gets just, I think I get even bolder. Like I said, the further I move along in my career yeah. and the further I get, you know, up there in age, because I know that I had advocates that advocated for me when I wasn't in the room. Right. And I'm not going to be having people out here mistreating students. Like, we're not going to have that, you know? All right. Okay, I have one more question for you, Dr. Morgan. Okay. Oops.
All right, so what are ways that you think, you know, and tying this back to um, self-care, what are ways that we can, I'm sorry, Dr. Mo, I'm lost. Okay, there you are. What are ways that we can um, continue to progress, you know, within our respective fields and our career paths while also not being consumed by work? Because... You know, the whole this whole um conference is centered around mental health, you know, taking care of um our well being. And I know a lot of times work can be stressful, you know, even when you're not, you know, all the way down the line, still even, you know, working working anywhere can be stressful at the end of the day. So how can we, you know, continue to grow, continue to um develop professionally while, you know, just maintaining our peace or like our, our, you know, our sense of, you know, I still have a life outside of what I do here. Okay. Okay. I like that question. So I just recently, I would say started doing that out over the past maybe four to five years. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, we can get so consumed in this grind culture where all you're doing is focusing, focusing, focusing on work, 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 right? So I finished Howard and I immediately went to get my master's. And then I took like a three or four year break. And then I immediately went to get my PhD, right? Um, and during that process, I'm gonna be very vulnerable right now. There's a part of me that resents um, that PhD because it took time away from family um, and friends. Right. Like things that keep you up at night, for instance. Right. Like I have to forever live with the fact that my mom's final voicemail to me was, I know you're busy writing your dissertation, but mommy misses you. Come see about mommy. And I made plans to go and see her that weekend and she's gone the next day. Mm -hmm. Right. So here I am. And yes, she understood. And yes, she was proud of me, but I should not have sacrificed that much time um and i could have been a lot more present so you know um <laughs> i now tell students you know and i hope i don't get trouble for cursing i'm like you know fuck school fuck that job right like if you need to go and be with family or friends or your loved ones you need to be there for yourself and your family friends and loved ones because work is always going to be there school is always going to be there and you don't have time. Like time is not forever. Like I legit thought that I had more time, you know? And I've had other close friends lose parents and they too pursued their PhD. And they were like, I just wish I had more time, right? So in this endeavor to grow professionally and become a part of this 1% of the world with a PhD, you sacrifice time with friends and families and you see that you've seen weddings, you've seen divorces, right? And it's not always worth it. Like, there will always be a small part of me that resents this degree, you know? Yeah, that's... that's that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's that's understandable. And I think um, for anybody listening, that could be like a life lesson, you know? I kind of have to remind myself to just slow down, like, you know, this, because I don't... Um, because I don't jump on this opportunity, my life isn't over. Or because I might have not done as well in this assignment, my life isn't over. Or I forgot to turn this assignment in, you know, you know, things will be okay. And um my mom, she had she had told me something. Uh it was about two summers ago. I was working at this job and I just I couldn't take anymore. Like I was done. I told my mom, expecting like this adverse reaction. I was like, oh Lord, she's probably gonna treat me. Say, like, Khalil, what you doing? You know, you gotta, you know, get your money because I was about to get my first apartment. So I'm like, I kind of don't want to tell her, but I have to because if I stop going, she's gonna be like, what's going on? And I told her, and she, you know, she told me, she was like, if this is what you feel like you have to do, you know, for your mental health, then I'm definitely all for it. Like, I support you. And so I think, you know, having that support system, and just like you said, you know, forget that job, forget school. Sometimes you do need to just, you know, focus on you because, 
it can just turn into a downward spiral when you're not taking care of yourself. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day. Oh, yeah. yeah. I love that. Um, go ahead, Anisha. No, I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Mobley, for really, really focusing on balance, because that's really what you're talking about, right? When you say at the job, at the school, it's maybe where's the balance in your life? Because a lot of us, we don't know how to do both. We get so focused on that one thing, and that's all we see. And the clients that I see in my practice, I've seen a lot of people get their PhD. Sometimes it takes them six, seven, eight years. And so they become just so focused on this that they forget about all the other things in their lives. So like, I really want to thank you for bringing up that balance and how do we keep that, especially as we have these students that are listening who are navigating into the workplace. So um, actually we have a question for you, Dr. Mobley. Uh, What advice would you give students preparing to graduate and into the workforce? Cause I know that there's a lot of anxiety. They may not always talk about it, but I know it's there. So how, what, what advice would you give? The best advice that I would give that I wish I would have taken advantage of much sooner in my career was to ask deeper and probing questions. And you're like, what do you mean? Um, You know, Dr. Mobley, you can tell a lot about a workplace and what questions you ask. I always ask, how did this position become vacant? Mm. Right. I always ask. What do you like about working there? What don't you like about working there? What would you change, right? Even when I'm having like, you know, this is much more pre-COVID, right? But even, you know, when I've had to interview in the height of the pandemic, um, I look at body language. Um, I wanna know who doesn't like each other. I wanna know, you know, cause you want to enter into that workplace and you could be entering into a lot of drama and I've entered into offices full of drama and it's not cool. Right. So I always ask a lot of like questions that are a bit, you know, off script so I can understand the culture of that environment um, and know what you're kind of walking into. Right. And I would even say after you get the job, um, keep asking those questions, if that makes sense. And learning and watching, you know, this office dynamic, because it can tell you a lot. Um, and it can save you a lot of heartache, you know, and also so that you don't kind of get caught up in office politics because folks will try to sway you um, before and after mm-hmm. about how you're how you're going to be able to able to navigate should you choose. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes a lot of Thank sense, you. actually. Yeah, I, um, I love this other question that we have. Um, how do you recommend finding your people at work? Because that's, you know. They balance you out, your people, your friends, you know, your work buddies, like people to help you navigate the this, this spaces and, you know, walk you through some things. I think that's a great question. Thank you very much. Sure. I love that question. So every job that I have had, I have ended up with like a work spouse, right? Um, who has been able to like help me navigate that office space. Um, even my work friends, like I was speaking with Khalil earlier, I always love George Chown as like this case study because it wasn't that I got along with everybody in that office, but most of that office loved me and I really, really um, loved them. But I think it's um, when you're in training, um, I think it can happen even in like casual conversation, right? Because people are going to ask you about yourself. Um, so people, you know, would learn that I was like a huge Janet Jackson fan, and we were able to like, you know, to bond off of that, or, you know, I will always leave the office, um, you know, for, to like get food for lunch. Like I wasn't a believer in sitting at my desk and eating um, because, you know, you're never gonna really get a break. Um, but I would say, I would say open up, I'd say use your spirit of discernment and you can find out who your people are gonna be at work. I will also say this because we are in a, in a HBC in a black environment. Um, I've had to learn about skin folk versus kin folk, and I always gravitate towards black people, but everybody black is not your friend, right? What I learned is that every white person isn't your enemy and every black person isn't family either, right? So I had to navigate that and that was a very hard lesson, but I do try to find the blacks um, <laughs> wherever I am, especially when I was a predominantly white space, because you know we're not always in abundance and around um, but I had to learn very quickly that even my black, you know, folks that work with me were not here for community and I had to become fine with that. And that was a hard lesson. 
Um, but I will, I look around whenever, even now, I'm at, I'm at the restaurant, I'm looking for where the Black folks are because, you know, it's a space of comfort in that way, you know? Yes, for real. Um, I would have to agree. And I just want to put this out there. Kim and I have been friends for over 25 years and we went to a PWI. So we went to a predominantly white school and 20 something years later, we still have a lot of our black friends from school. So like we became family and I don't even call us as friends anymore. We became family. So yes, I do know that feeling of looking around and seeing who's there and, and figuring out how do I make this connection? So Khalil for you, I'm gathering you've had internships already. Like, how did you find your people at your internship? Or or did you? And what was that like for you? Um, so really, I'm going to just piggy off, piggyback off Dr. Mowgli. I'm going to okay. look for the black people first. Just being a problem, I'm look for the black people first. <laughs> and I think it's sort of like a filling out process. Like, um, you're always going to gravitate towards your type of person. So I think as you kind of develop, like, you know, more um, intimate conversations, maybe like just kind of figure out who they are really. I think it becomes easier to kind of find out, you know, okay, this is gonna be my my work friend or somebody that I can uh, bounce off this idea to, or I can come to if I have like maybe a problem with our another coworker or a supervisor. So just kind of, I think as you, just kind of talk to them more because I have found um, like a lot of good work friends. Like it's possible, but for sure, just just opening yourself up more, especially in like those initial phases of getting the job, just so you know people could kind of see who you are as a person, and maybe they'll you know come to you and y'all can you know connect that way. But yeah, I think just just being uh, comfortable and opening up. To kind of okay. find your, your group. I love that because that goes back to what we were talking about with relationship building and skill set, right? Being vulnerable, being open, being willing to, you know, say like, oh, I like your tie or I like your shirt or something. It, it, it applies anywhere, whether it's work or home, but especially in work, I think, you know, when you go into a workspace, you don't know people and you don't quite know, you don't want to make a misstep. And so sometimes you'll edit yourself or, or dim yourself down because you're not quite sure of the, the culture a little bit. Right. So I think with another good question we have is what are healthy practices in workplaces that students should look for? And we'll ask that of both of you, but uh, we'd love for uh, Khalil to go first and then you, Dr. Mobley. Hmm. Can you repeat the question? Uh, <clears throat> what are healthy practices in workplaces that students should look for? healthy practices. Right. Um, so for I instance, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm not sorry. You can finish. Maybe they help me understand. Kind of like how, you know, the culture, just what are things that people should look for in terms of how they treat employees or what kind mm -hmm. of um, environment um, should, you know, students be looking for? Okay. Um, I think one thing off top is if you are able to like observe um, the the workspace, um, maybe get a feel for the demographics, like how many people are there that look like me? Um, are there more men or more women? Just to kind of get into the, um, like the specifics. I think another thing is, you know, the managerial staff, like how how are they as, you know, the people that are, over you, are they going to try to maybe abuse their power, or are they um, are they lenient? You know, especially with people just now coming to the job, are they uh, compassionate in this field? Do they do a good job of mentoring? I think that's something that you can look at. Um, and I think something else that I would maybe advise to look for is time off policies. If I'm being real, <laughs> do you, do, balance. Do you That's a balance. That's a balance. Do you all offer paid time off? Do you all get do we do? Does the company offer sick pay? Um, if I just want to take like a mental health day, some of my professors will have mental health days, and all you gotta do is email and say, "Look, professor, I I just don't have it in me today. Like 
I took the test yesterday, took one, got one tomorrow. Like, I just need today to kind of study, try and get my mind right. And they'll let you just miss the day with no penalty. So does, you know, our employer offer things like that? I think those are maybe three, three, three key things I would look for. Love that. That's resonating. Okay. <laughs> I would jump in. One thing that I was not focused on fresh out of the undergrad that I wish I were, we're looking more at um my benefits package, right? So it's so important. So think about healthy and cultural practices, right? Um, you may be 22 or, you know, however you all are old when you're graduating, but you know, what is the retirement package like? Like, you should be thinking about that now. You should be thinking about that at every job you have since then, right? I didn't care about that um, when at my very, very first job, you know, out of graduate school. And I paid a bit of a price for that. That was two years out of my life that I could have been putting towards my financial future. Um, not even with retirement, but, you know, you can use those benefits for, um, you know, buying a home or, you know, other types of things like that. I also think another thing um, Khalil did say about the, the time off and the leave, um, I will also say, how are they going to be investing in you? So what does professional development look like, right? Are you going to be able to go to conferences? Can you go back to school um, and that can be paid for, you know, a bit because of your service to whatever institution that you're working at, right? Those things matter and they do add up. Um, and I will also think about, um, even with like healthy cultural practices, one thing that stood out with me um, whenever I was looking for a job or when I was able to get the job that stands out is what is your probationary period? <laughs> and asking about that because you can be on probation for a month, three months, or even a year so you can get fired at will during that probationary period so think about before you sign that contract and asking things like that right if you can't get more money because you know cash is king are you going to pay for me to go to a conference are you going to pay for me to go professional development like what are some other things you can get you know um in your asks those of you all that may want to go back to school or graduate school eventually i wasn't able to negotiate um more pay well yes i was but you know beyond the pay you know scale and reach that i was able to get um i was able to negotiate days off to like write my dissertation right so every friday i didn't have to go to work because i was writing because my boss was invested in me finishing school if that makes sense there are other things and other ways that you can look at with regard to a workplace or having healthy um or things that are going to help you progress that I don't think we often think about, especially Black folks, because, you know, we just so like happy to get the job that we don't want to push back or we don't feel as if we're in a place to negotiate with everybody else is doing the same thing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And I think, again, this goes back to having a voice. So thank you for that. That's helping these students, you know, that's on this conference know that you have to figure out a way to have a voice. It's not going to just be important in your personal relationships, but also your professional professional relationships as well. And so how do you continue to find your voice and learn how to advocate for yourself? So thank you for that. Advocating. Um, advocating. We've got one yeah. more question, one more question. And I think this is really about how do you discern um, the place that you need to be and maybe when to leave, right? Like, how do you navigate a system that sucks? Um, when you have a lot to work, <laughs> I, you know, I think um, someone said in the chat that um, it doesn't feel like these spaces and places and work environments um, are for us. And, you know, it's very hard to navigate that if you're by yourself or if you're a small group, because it's hard to, you know, get people galvanized to make changes within a, a system sometimes. And so navigating that for yourself to get what you need and then, you know, trying to figure out which, what place should I be landing in in terms of you know, small, large, medium, like, you know, work from home, going in five days a week. There's so many different ways to um, to be at work these days. And so, you know, what are those things look like for people? And what are some tools or like some real tips that you can give to like helping people navigate spaces like that? So how to know when to leave? Yeah. So or, or choose, 
one of the questions, you know. Okay, okay. Well, and how to find a good fit. That's what I'm hearing. Yes, right? yes. Um, I think you have to have your non-negotiables um, in, a, in a bit of a way, right? Uh, where you think you can work or where you don't think you can thrive. Listen to yourself on the inside with regard to that, right? Like I've had some serious, you know, um, quote unquote deal breakers, right? Like I am a DC native, I'm from Washington, DC. I was not gonna look for a job in California because I was too far from family, right? And too far from community, right? So are you gonna be doing nationwide search or regional search? Or is it gonna be in certain pockets, right? Um, that's just one example, right? Of location, location, location. Um, you wanna be in suburbia, do you wanna be in a big city? You know, what does that look like? Um, I also think that people should be more in tune. I wish that I was <laughs> to exactly like the cost of living um, when trying to choose a job because yeah, I can go on a whole tangent about the debt I put myself through in my twenties and I don't want to bore you all with that, but I was living beyond my means because I want to live in certain places. Um, but knowing when to leave, I think is an important question, right? I think we as black folks hold on a bit too longer. I knew, and I was a vulnerable graduate student, right? When I was working at a job, um, at the University of Maryland, where I got my PhD. And I knew that myself and my supervisor were incompatible in different ways. But there was one time when my mom got me rushed to the emergency room, and I literally dropped everything. Um, I didn't go to class that evening, and I went to the hospital. And the next day I came back, I was reprimanded by my boss because he said, well, students were looking for you, and you didn't cancel your appointment. And I was like, my mother is in ICU. Right, like I don't, I didn't really have time to think about canceling appointments or I had to get to the hospital. Um, and his response was, well, I don't know what that's like because I don't have a close relationship with my mother. And I knew then that I had to leave that office. Mm. So because of your relationship with your mother, <laughs> you're judging me on my relationship with my mother and how I need to be beholden to this job in a very specific way. And I knew then that I had to begin my exit strategy. And that's what I did, right? You have to listen to those whispers and those voices um, in the world and the community around you to know when a place is toxic and plan your exit strategy. Now, I'm not a fan of people just quitting jobs without a job, right? Like, I will stay in a job before I have another one. So please don't Come quit on, job Dr. Mobley. <laughs> please do not quit your job without a job, but begin your exit strategy. And that's the thing I will say, too, is that the one thing that I love about um, us as Black folks, and even my friends that I think about from across the spectrum at different HBCUs, lean on your community and ask questions mm. about, because you never know who knows who, right? So I've had friends hit me up about different universities or different, and I've been able to place them in contact with different folks, some in higher ed, right? So um, your networks are much smaller or if I'm able to use or lean on other friends and communities to place them in contact with other folks to help them tell them about the job. Like if they worked at Delta, for instance, or they worked at CNN, I have, those are just examples, right? But don't be afraid to ask your friends who's who um, throughout your entire life, because they may know somebody that's there that you can get a candid conversation with of what is it really like working there, you know? Um, don't be afraid to lean on your community in that way to get the real scoop before you take a job or sign that contract. Hmm. Do you have any um, other tips you want to add? Thank you, Dr. Mobley. That was excellent. I love that. Lots of good. Let me just say, in. people like to talk about themselves and they like to talk about what they do. So don't ever be afraid <laughs> to ask people what they do. Can I come in one day? Can I shadow you? Can you tell me more about what you do? And always, always, always lean on your alumni. Yeah. Listen, go to the career office, lean on your alumni. Alumni always like to help other alumni or, you know, incoming, uh, you know, graduates. So I think you always want to kind of lean on that. Always go to career development office, ask for help. Yes, they will help. They are very happy to help at all times. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Mobley, for, you know, being vulnerable and, you know, sharing your experiences. Because that definitely, that would have been my, my cue to leave that job as well. Um, I think that I'm looking at uh, 
Katisha. I'm sorry if I'm messing your name up. Katisha. Um, I think you know, it is it could be it could be um easy to leave a job or like multiple jobs when you I feel like you don't really feel like that's your fit. And then finding my fit, I think I I try to find comfortability, comfortable comfortability, I'm sorry. Um, and my coworkers, uh, managers, uh, the whole nine, I try to find a job that is like purposeful uh, as far as what I want to do down the line. So and me wanting to work with kids, uh, find the job where I'm, uh, you know, maybe supervising or like in close proximity with, you know, kids, that would be, you know, that would be a motivating factor to keep me coming back to this job. Um, so comfortability, purpose and um, like Dr. Moby was saying, somewhere that's, you know, the area has to be nice, too, because at the end of the day, you know, it is going to be kind of like your second home. Um, So I think just finding a job that's in the area that you enjoy, maybe that you could get like a coffee or a slice of pizza after work, um, because, you know, there are um, resources or like amenities in place for you to enjoy yourself outside of that environment. I think that's important as well. Um. And when it's time to leave a job, I think, you know, Dr. Mobley gave a perfect example where you feel like, you know, the people there aren't necessarily serving you or, you know, the relationship has gone to a point where you're not necessarily, maybe they're benefiting from your work, but you're not seeing that same type of benefit reciprocated, maybe whether it's financially or even in, you know, and more intimate aspects, like being compassionate, you know, uh, like Dr. Moby was saying, you know, the person he dealt with obviously lacked the basic compassion to um, to interact with him in, in that sense. So I just think, you know, once you once you figure out like, yeah, this this just isn't this isn't serving me anymore. I think that's that's when you should definitely leave. But now before you get, you know, the other job, like Dr. Moby said. Just to make sure you, <laughs> just to make sure you stay at the end of the day. Well, so I, I would okay. If I would say this, if it's if it's harming your mental health, you have to make a choice, right? Like, what what choice do you need to make for yourself? If it's, you know, a lot of people experience anxiety on the job, physical, mental, emotional um, toil, and you know that's a tough decision, and sometimes you have to choose yourself. So I I'll just put that as a caveat. Or an asterisk on the note, but I agree with I do agree with that. Stick it out as long as you can, I would say. Yeah. But if if you gotta go, just go. But stick it out before you get the other job. Try to. But save um, while you're working, so if you have to leave, you just have some money. Yes. I just be concerned about. That's right. That part. Say, yeah. <laughs> say, yeah. That part. Because if you gotta go back home to the parents, and it's not a good situation, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So. I love that. Um, I, I want to ask this question because I think I, I, there's a question that was in the chat. And if we can wrap up after that, that would be great. Um, suppose you get the job, but you have little to no experience. What should you do? And I think this is important for a lot of, um, you know, graduates. That's going to be their story, right? Like, how do they move up or, or do, you know, do the job? If you have little to no experience in the job, what do you do from there? Yes. I like that. Um, well, I've always been, not always, but whenever I get an opportunity or a job, especially when I was first starting out, um, I knew they were taking a chance on me, but I also knew that I deserved and I earned that job. Does that make sense? So yes. I think they knew that I may not have had all the experience, but I was very trainable and I asked questions. And I wanted to get in there and, and hit the ground running in a very particular way. Um, imposter syndrome is very real, but I think that if you walk in with confidence, and again, don't be afraid to ask questions, um, that's very, very important. I always tell my students, especially my Black students, um, walk into a job like you're a mediocre white man, right? They ask for everything with the least work. They consider, they continue to, you know, they, they, they fail up, right? So go in there with the confidence of a mediocre white man and ask all your questions and get your things. 
because there are plenty of them that do, don't deserve what they're getting and what they have, but they go in there with that confidence and they and they demand certain things because of privilege, if that makes sense. Um, and that's what I was told when I was starting out, right? You ask for everything as if you're a mediocre white person. And that is how I've lived my professional life with regard to negotiation if I don't know something, because they will ask for everything and we'll, be, we'll sit up there suffering in silence and not performing, if that makes sense. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Thank you for that. Um, so just thank you, Dr. Mosley. Yeah. Oh, we got more. I'm so sorry. No, I think it's interesting for Khalil to answer that because the stage of life that he's in. So we have two different perspectives about that, which okay. would be really cool. Khalil's mom is on. She's proud of you. Okay, she in the chat. Okay. <laughs> hey, mom. I need that homework. That's we right. Take Thank you, mom. Clean. Well, we want, we definitely got to end with you now, Khalil. What's the, you know, what should, what should take away your table? Um, I would say that um, I'm sorry, I forgot the question. Now we were oh, talking that's about okay. you had a moment of joy. <laughs> um, suppose <laughs> you get the job, but you have little to no experience. What okay, should you do? Um, so I think Dr. Mobley brought up a good point in saying to ask questions. I think um, something I'm not really afraid to do, but sometimes I don't want to seem like I'm a fool. Like, cause sometimes I feel like the questions I can ask can be very like minuscule or like, why are you asking that? It's simple, but sometimes it's not simple to me. So I think just being unafraid to ask questions because, you know, sometimes um, tasks within the context of, you know, what you're working on, can be a little difficult. So just being honest, you know, reaching out to a coworker, reaching out to, you know, upper support staff, because um, the job I have now, I could say that I definitely wasn't as prepared as I'd like to be. Um, I work with special needs kids. And so I've, you know, worked in summer camps or like, you know, different environments with children. But, you know, this is, for me, it was like um, the same type of, you know, at the end of the day, I was working with kids. So that's like, I guess my, the basis of what I enjoy, but now it's like a different, kind of different realm within childcare. So now I have to figure out, okay, how how do I interact with this child? How can I, you know, reach them best, you know, to be effective in, you know, my teaching and, you know, mentorship role for these kids. So I just think being, being unafraid to ask questions and to kind of step into the role of the rookie because you know this is like your first season you know you're just getting into the job so learn from the veterans and you know just keep picking up knowledge soaking everything in and before you know it you'll reach your you know one year mark like i just did at the job I'm working i just reached my one year mark and it'll be All two right. years five years ten years so just ask questions thank you <laughs> I, can i add this one little thing i just want to say that most of us, when we graduate from school, we don't have any experience. Like some of us were able to do internships, but a lot of us were not, or you got an internship that has nothing to do with the first job that you have. And so you think that you're the only one, you are not alone in that experience. And a lot of times what a college degree just shows that you are trainable. That's it. That they can train you on how to do the job. So when you go in there, know that 10 other people feel the exact same way that you do every day that they walking into that job. And that's okay not to know. But if you don't know, you have to ask questions. So I really think that that is a really big deal. Both Khalil and Dr. Mobley said that, but you have to ask questions. Thank you so much. This was fun. Um, thank you, Dr. Mobley and Khalil for the fireside chat. And you can learn more about them in the speaker bios.